and the experiences you'll find them really encouraging, motivating so that we all aim to endure to the end because that's what it's all about now enduring to the end with courage you know sometimes um, brothers and sisters get morbid anxious thoughts about whether they will endure at the end but it's getting there that's the difficulty with all of us that's why Jesus said he that endures to the end is the one that will be saved and uh, we realize from the circuit assembly program that that's the intention of the faithful and very discreet slave to help us just do that but to enjoy enduring uh, to the end you're going to really enjoy the assembly it's going to focus attention on the need to be even more God-fearing that's all of us whether we've been in the truth a little while or a long while we all need to close the gap a little more and fear Jehovah much more because when we fear Jehovah we fear nobody else that's the marvelous benefit of course of rendering sacred service with godly fear now it's that uh, subject that we want to talk about tonight reflecting upon that kingdom song that was based upon Psalms 91 you only think of the words of that psalm and that song it's only a man of courage that would sing words like those words so as a sort of platform or basis to build the talk upon, what would you think of this scripture as a, a key scripture of our talk for tonight? Because we'll go right into the subject. James chapter 5 is the theme scripture. I'm sure you'll agree with me, this gives us plenty of opportunity for talking uh, for a little while. James 5 verse 10. James' advice to you and me was, Brothers, take as a pattern of the suffering of evil and the exercising of patience the prophets who spoke in the name of Jehovah I think the kingdom interlinear says brothers take as a pattern the suffering of evil and the longness of spirit of the prophets the longness of spirit and that's what we certainly need when we were on the circuit near here 20 years ago 1968 visiting the congregations in Fife we were telling the brothers then that the time was urgent because we were deep into the time of the end we're telling the brothers now we're in the time of the end of the time of the end we must be it'll be 1989 soon and if Jehovah's patience continues to last out a little while longer, it'll be 1990. We've been living in the time of the end since the year 1914. We need to take as a pattern the longness of spirit of some of the prophets who spoke in the name of Jehovah. Which one would immediately come to your mind? And you'll know the account, you'll know the pattern that was set by him. And it was the man Moses. And the reason why we've picked him just as a pattern or a model is because the commission that was given to Moses it was a, a commission to take good news to people very similar to our commission now we know what it was Jehovah wanted Moses to go to Egypt and have his people set free so that they could live in paradise or the account says live in a land flowing with milk and honey does that sound familiar to our message well it is we've been reading through the revelation book haven't we and we know now quite clearly what Egypt pictures Egypt pictures the world the world of mankind that alienated from God and that's where we have been set free from and the truth has made us free and what are we all looking forward to living forever in paradise on earth and even now of course living in a land flowing with milk and honey from a spiritual standpoint now the obvious question that we ask right at the outset when Jehovah gave the commission to Moses did Moses want to go everyone shaking their head so it must be no why didn't he want to go because what we have to do is to take as a pattern this prophet who spoke in the name of Jehovah would like to shout out so he couldn't speak now that's the immediate uh, thought that comes to mind poor Moses he couldn't put two words together we would say don't you believe it we know he could 
because eventually he was used by Jehovah and he did inspire the confidence of three million Hebrew brothers of his and their families and brought them out of Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey. We also know that the book of Deuteronomy, that was written by who? Who wrote the book of De Deuteronomy? Who was it? You tell us. Who do you think it was? Well, you can't be wrong if you say Moses, because he's the one we're talking about. It was Moses, and it's described as four major speeches of Moses. I wonder why he didn't want to go. Because notice what it says in the book of Acts, uh, in chapter 7. And bear in mind now that Stephen is about to be stoned to death. And he was the only one that was inspired to tell us this about Moses. And notice what he tells us in verse 22, Acts chapter 7. Clearly it says, Consequently, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. In fact, he was powerful in his words and deeds. Oh yes, he probably had this physical impediment. But that was no real problem to Moses. And if he was raised in the household of Pharaoh, then you can be sure he was instructed in all of the wisdom of uh, the Pharaohs. He was raised in Egypt as a prince. And there's no doubt about it, as Josephus described Moses, if that was his background, he must have been a powerful orator. He must have had a way with words. So it would be a very good exercise just to take a look very briefly at the pattern uh, that was set by the experience of Moses in the book of Exodus. So should we do that? I know we've read through it many, many times before, but let's see if we could get even more from our reading uh, from tonight's discussion. Exodus chapter 2 is where we could take up the experience. And please take note that when we read verse 11 and verse 12, Moses at this stage was a prince in Egypt and his age was 40. 40 years of age. That can be cross-referred to Acts chapter 7 and it will give you that detail. Now what was he like at the age of 40? It says in verse 11, Now it came about in those days, as Moses was becoming strong, that he went out to his brothers that he might look at the burdens that they were bearing. And he caught sight of a certain Egyptian striking a certain Hebrew of his brothers. So he turned this way and that and saw there was nobody in sight. Then he struck the Egyptian down and hid him in the sand. What sort of a man was Moses at the age of 40 when he was becoming strong? Would you say that that experience uh, seems to depict a man that could well be described in Numbers? Uh, chapter 12, is it? As the meekest man in all the earth. Well, was he meek? Brother, please. He seems to come across as a bit impetuous at this stage. Very much so. Uh, there was no meekness in Moses at the age of 40. Moses raised uh, with the household of Pharaoh. He was the sort of man that would rely heavily upon the arm of flesh before he would rely on anyone else. He was a belligerent, warlike person. He was aggressive. But Jehovah knew that he had the potential to be the meekest man in all the earth. And we know, looking back at the man, that he was that before he led God's people out of Egypt. He had many natural talents and natural abilities. He was a prince in Egypt. Uh, one ability he didn't seem to have was to be able to see straight, because when he looked this way and that and saw there was nobody in sight, well, there was somebody in sight, and they saw him as well. And when he came back to that place the following day, they confronted him with the murder. And they told him what they had seen. Moses fled from Egypt. And the Bible account indicates that he left Egypt. He, went, he must have gone across the Sinai Peninsula and began to live in a place called Midian. And he married a woman in Midian. In fact, when we read chapter 3, just over the page... In verse 1, it says, Moses became a shepherd of the flock of Jethro. Why would I be correct in saying that although he left as a prince, he arrived there and continued to be something of a pauper? Why would we say that? Why would we say that his lifestyle would be that of a pauper, a lowly person, if he became a shepherd of the flock of Jethro? Do you like to tell us, brother? 
because the shepherd lugged out with his flock. He didn't, as they were, live in the, the, the big house and just wonder how they were getting on. He was out there looking after them at night, sleeping beside them or, and watering them and feeding them, taking them around, so he was living a very poor life. Yes, to an Egyptian especially, because when Joseph lived in Egypt, his brothers, they were herders of sheep. And Joseph warned them when they were in Egypt to be very careful about making that known. He said in Genesis 46, just as a cross-reference, Genesis 46 and verse 30, a herder of sheep is a detestable thing in Egypt. They were viewed with disdain. You know, anyone could be a shepherd. I mean, you've hit rock bottom when you become a shepherd. Although what lovely qualities would Moses learn living under the stars at night? He'd learn a lesson in man's littleness. I mean, one quality that seems to be outstanding with sheep, and certainly little lambs, is that quality of meekness, and being willing, uh, willing to be directed by someone. So he must have learned all of those qualities as a shepherd. And he'd learned them for many, many years, because when we get to chapter 3 and verse 1, according to the cross-references, Moses now is at the age of 80. So now at the age of 80, he had become a meek person, maybe shy and diffident as well, not as eager as before to see that his Hebrew brothers met with justice. But just notice what the pattern is that's set from verse 1. In part B of the verse, it says in chapter 3 and verse 1, while he was driving the flock to the west side of the wilderness, he came at length to the mountain of the true God, to Horeb. Then Jehovah's angel appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a thorn bush. Now would that be a very unusual thing for a thorn bush to catch fire? Or for brush to catch fire in a wilderness place like Horeb? The answer is obvious. It would be no. And it caused no concern or consternation to Moses, as there he was minding his own business, tending his sheep and lambs. Although what does it say in the second part of verse 2? It says, as he kept looking, now for how long we don't know, but it must have been for quite a period of time. It says, why, here the thorn bush was burning with the fire, and yet the thorn bush was not consumed. Now was that unusual? Well, the thing's been the same shape and size, burning furiously now for maybe half an hour or more, or maybe even longer. Now, that was unusual. He realized that that bush should have just disintegrated, burned away, and blown away by now. Take note, though, that Jehovah's angel has not said anything to him. All Moses is confronted by is a burning bush, and there's no doubt about it, there was an angel that was fanning the flames of that bush. It says there in verse 3, It was at this that Moses said, Let me just turn aside that I may inspect this great phenomenon as to why the thorn bush is not burnt up. Now when Jehovah saw that he turned aside to inspect, God at once called to him out of the midst of the thorn bush. Now that must be quite significant then. Jehovah was waiting for the man Moses to make this move and turn aside to inspect. As soon as he did that, Jehovah revealed himself to him and revealed some lovely things to Moses. Notice in verse 6 of chapter 3, Jehovah immediately reveals who he is when he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What would Moses immediately realize? Why, he was, he was in the presence of Jehovah God. And we know that because Moses immediately removed his sandals and he had godly fear, didn't he? In verse 7, Jehovah added, Unquestionably I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their outcry as a result of those who drive them to work, because I well know the pains they suffer. You can almost imagine the feeling that was expressed in that. Moses did. I would think being an 80-year-old shepherd, now possibly shy by nature, because he'd lose those brash ways living in a wilderness place. His eyes probably filled up with tears when he realized that here was a God, the Most High, who was really concerned about his people in Egypt. And it must have sounded marvelous to Moses 
Now he's well along in years when Jehovah said to him in verse 8, And I am proceeding to go down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up out of that land to a land flowing with milk and honey. My, how would that have sounded to Moses? He must have been overwhelmed by the promise. In fact, it all sounded marvellous to Moses up until verse 10. And then it wasn't so marvellous, and Moses was not slow in speech. It says in verse 10, Jehovah's angel speaking, And now come and let me send you to Pharaoh, and you bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. How does verse 11 begin? What's the one word? However. Moses very quickly is able to put words together when he says to Jehovah, Who am I? That, that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I have to bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. I mean, I'm just an old man, and a shepherd. He didn't want to go. Incidentally, there's no mention about this slow of speech. But he did not want to go. Jehovah encourages him in verse 12, and says to him, because I shall prove to be with you, you go. Although, how does verse 13 begin? Nevertheless, he's very quick with his reasons and excuses is the word, really. When it says in verse 13, suppose I now come to the sons of Israel, and I do say to them, the God of your forefathers has sent me to you, and they do say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? What will I do if they start asking me questions? Now Jehovah understands his feeling and so from verse 15 onwards Jehovah explains to him word for word what he can say to the sons of Israel. How does chapter 4 begin? Verse 1. Sister please. He starts off with the excuse again, however. That's it. Moses couldn't speak. He was one of the fastest talkers there could have ever been when it came to working out reasons and thinking up excuses for not going to Egypt and having God's people set free. I mean, that's quite a classic one there in verse 1 of chapter 4. He says, But um, suppose they do not believe me and do not listen to my voice because they're going to say, Jehovah did not appear to you. We remember you anyway. You came from Egypt 40 years ago. Now, Jehovah... He did not lose confidence in Moses. He wanted Moses to be courageous and strong and fulfill his commission. Can any of the children tell us, what does Jehovah ask Moses now as he stood there with this excuse? Suppose they do not believe me and do not listen to my voice. Brother, right at the back. He tells him to throw down his rod and it becomes a, into a serpent. And then he says, grab it by the tail and it becomes a rod in his palm again. Mark, would you like to come and finish the talk? <laughs> that's very good, that's excellent, that. That's exactly what Jehovah said. You know, as Moses stands there, dithering about this assignment, this privilege, Jehovah says to him, what is that in your hand? And you can imagine him saying it, a rod. And Jehovah says, throw it on the earth. And as soon as it hit the earth, it wriggled. What did it become? You tell us. I'd like to shout out. A snake. Well, he said a serpent. Well, it was a serpent. You know the difference? A serpent, a big snake. And when it wriggled on the floor, this enormous serpent, full of life, tingling with life, Jehovah said to Moses in verse 4 of chapter 4, Thrust your hand out and grab hold of it by the tail. Now, we know that wouldn't be the normal place to pick up this serpent. But he did, and it became a rod again. And this was no mere magical trick, because Jehovah says to him in verse 5, it was in order that, to quote him, they may believe that Jehovah, the God of their forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. And before he had recovered from that, Jehovah says, stick your hand, please, into the upper fold of your garment. And he did. Jehovah says, take it out. And he did, and his hand was filled with leprosy. Jehovah says, put it back. Return it to the fold of your garment. And Jehovah also says, take it out. And when he drew it out, his hand was clean. At first it was filled with leprosy, 
unclean, because that's what it's a symbol of, and next it was clean. And there was a reason for that, according to verse 8. Jehovah said, if they will not believe you and will not listen to the voice of the first sign, then they'll certainly believe the voice of the later sign. And then Jehovah gave him a third sign. It was only at that point, it says in verse 10, that Moses came out with his best, one of all, and stuttered every word of it when he said, Excuse me, Jehovah, but I'm not a fluent speaker. Couldn't speak properly. Rendered speechless. Not Moses. In fact, Jehovah had empathy for him, and Jehovah said to him, although in anger at this point, he said, well, Aaron's a fluent speaker. Aaron. Now he'll do the speaking. And what would you imagine Moses would say to that? Now there's a, a very good idea. Why not send Aaron? And not me. I wonder why he didn't want to go. Well, Jehovah knew all the time. And we can work it out very quickly from verse 19 of chapter 4. It says, After that, Jehovah said to Moses in Midian, Go return to Egypt, because all the men who were hunting for your soul are dead. Then Moses took his wife and his sons, made them ride on an ass, and he proceeded to return to the land of Egypt. Why didn't he want to go? And if we tend to hold back from our commission to go, what's the reason? Really? What is the reason if we tend to hold off and hold back, Sister Nelson? Fear of man. It's nice to admit to that, because that's what it is. If we're really honest in the privacy of our own minds, that's what the problem is. If we tend to hold back and hold off from sharing the good news with others. Well, that's discussed at the assembly. It is so because, you know, when we've got these bigger houses, we tend to... Th think all sorts of things, don't we? In fact, we say some funny things. You see these big houses, we say things like, well, they've got their kingdom. All they've got is a big house and the headaches to go with them. They need the truth just like anyone else would need the truth. But we need to convince ourselves of that. They've usually got these wrought iron gates that are never oiled. Though the householder always hears you at the gate. The pathways are always the crunchy pathways and their bells always work. And we're thinking all sorts of things in here, but how we're going to cope and handle the situation. Let's go back to the uh, pattern that was set, because that was what James said. Is it a similar pattern to what we could follow? Well, let's just think about uh, chapter 3, it was. Moses was there minding his own business, and a bush begins to burn. Causes him no concern, because it does not affect him and his livestock. But when it continues to burn... When this angel that what Jehovah was using was able to keep it burning and blazing and yet not disintegrate, it made Moses curious. Now think about that pattern that's left behind. When we go from house to house this week, would you agree that the people that we call upon, before we get there, they're just minding their own business, tending to what needs to be done either in the home or in the garden or at the shops or wherever it might be. Uh, we will work the territory and it's probably been worked a thousand times before. It's the same streets, it's the same people. But what might they say as they continue to see us coming, as they continue to see Jehovah's Witnesses enthusiastic about the truth, only that way because of angels in heaven fanning the flames of that enthusiasm? What might they say? Brother, please. What have they got that keeps them going? Yes, in fact, somebody will say that to you more than likely this week. Why do you people keep calling? What is it? Or it may not be put that way. The Bible here says that they might just think, well, let me just turn aside that I may inspect this great phenomenon as to why this bush continues to burn. It's a very simple parallel. That's the way we got the truth, and that's the way they will get the truth. Or somebody might say to you, oh, well, you know your Bible, I'm not interested personally. But, um, now I've asked people this question, I've asked the Pope of Rome, the man next door, the milkman, the local priest, you won't be able to answer it. If there was Adam and Eve, and they only had two sons, I'm right, aren't I? They only had two sons, one was Cain, and the other was Abel, and Cain killed Abel, then went and got married, now there you are. Where did he get his wife from? 
Now you might think, well what a simplistic question because that's easily answered in this scripture and that. But you never know, they're turning around to inspect. Just with a half-hearted question even, they just might be attracted to the truth. I mean, have you ever showed a person an answer to a question like that? Their eyes can't believe it. And it makes them think. Some of them even go indoors and get down their Bible and take a look for themselves. I know that sort of experience always reminds me of the modern day drama we had at one of the conventions. It was about seven years ago now. You'll remember the drama. It was about a young child or children who were Jehovah's Witnesses and the mum and dad were witnesses. But the grandfather was not a witness. He used to smoke. His name was Nottingham Goodenough. Well that was what it said in the script. The young child showed the grandfather God's name in Psalms 83 and verse 18 and he was impressed. Although he didn't submit to that in front of them. When all of the family left the stage, they'd gone to bed. Can anyone recall what the grandfather did? Nottingham good enough. As he's there in the privacy of the room, with the privacy of his own thoughts. Remember what he did? He went to the bookcase, took down that King James Version, and looked at it for himself. And it was that that brought him along into the truth. Now, just think about verse 6 of chapter 3. What was one of the very first things that was revealed to Moses? Why God revealed himself to Moses and explained to him who he was. Isn't it a well-known fact that in all of our Bible study aids, in either chapter 2 or 3, no later than chapter 4, the chapter heading is all about what subject? Well, it's the subject. Who is God? Always. That's the pattern. And we learn what God's name is and we learn that he has qualities and that he is the father and Jesus Christ is his only begotten son basic things but wouldn't you agree that was marvelous to learn that that God had a name and his name was Jehovah he became a real person to us and also verse 7 why that's a subject in all of our Bible study aids we've had booklets with this subject and the subject is is there a God who cares why does God permit wickedness? Will wickedness ever end? And when we found the answers to those things, it was marvellous. And how about verse 8? If you were to give that a chapter heading, or the title of one of our books, what would it be? When Jehovah says, I'm going to bring them up out of that land, and take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Brother, please. You can see it was after Armageddon of Paradise Earth. Mm. That's the book we have at the moment. You go from house to house, and we actually say to people, you can live forever in paradise on earth. That's marvellous. Do you know, barring some fatal disease, which we hope none of us will contract, we're going to live forever. We are living in the time of the end of the time of the end. Imagine nobody's going to go to your funeral. We're going to live forever in paradise on earth. That's a marvellous thing. And that's featured, of course, in the public talk on Sunday. We're going to actually live at a time when we meet each other. We'll never, ever need to say, how are you? What a stupid question that will be. <laughs> According to Isaiah 33 and verse 24, which says, no resident will say, I am sick. That's marvellous. You believe it, don't you? Well, when we're convinced of it, it's amazing how that helps us and motivates us to go from house to house with that good news. Yes, we're all looking forward to the time, all four of us, and it's the same with you, when someone will say to us, and how old are you now? And I'm going to say, do you know, I've just turned 8 billion, 7 million. <laughs> it's 6,321, and they're always going to say, you haven't changed <laughs> in the last 8 billion years. We believe that. That's what we take to people as the kingdom good news. We are totally convinced of that. And when we learn that, wouldn't you agree it was the most marvellous thing that we'd ever heard? The truth was marvellous to us right up until verse 10. When the brother studying with us just hinted at, and now, come and let me send you to Pharaoh. And you must go from house to house taking the good news of the kingdom to others. How did that sound to you? And be honest, we're thinking about when you f were first invited into the field ministry, how did it sound to you? Did you want to go? 
I mean, did you say, that's marvellous, I've been waiting for you to raise this subject for months now. Well, you didn't. Well, some of you might have, but most of us didn't. I wonder if you said what Moses said in verse 11 to the one studying with you. Well, it's all marvellous, this, but who am I that I should go? I mean, I can't go from house to house. I'm not qualified to speak to people. And what was it that encouraged us, according to verse 12, when the brother teaching us said, you know, Jehovah will prove to be with you. This is his work. He is the sponsor behind this work. He'll help you. And even though we knew that, how did verse 13 begin? Well, we said the same thing. We said to the brother, well, I believe that, but suppose I do go to people from house to house, and I say, I'm a minister. And they start asking me questions like, what about this? And what about that? What will I say to them? We've reasoned that way. And yet we learned, according to verses 15 onwards, that we can find the answers to their questions. And now we've got that marvellous publication, Reasoning, from the Scriptures. Although, how did chapter 4 begin? Well, some of us have even taken it that far. We've actually said, but suppose they do not believe me. I mean, I know I'll be with Jehovah's people doing his work, and I'll know that I'll be able to find answers. But suppose they do not believe me, and uh, do not listen to my voice, because they're going to say probably what Jehovah hadn't appeared to you. We have a reason that way. Well, you have. Oftentimes, we get assigned territory Wednesday morning, and we have to work, say, the even numbers of Babel Avenue. If you start at number two, brother, and go up to number 100, and we'll have a brother work to meet you. So we say, well, that's fine. But oftentimes this happens. After about 30 minutes, the brother working to meet, uh, to meet us comes down to us, and he says, I wonder if you would call at 42. I'll tell you why. He knows me. Well, I used to work with him, actually. Uh, and I think he'll accept it better from you. Have you said that? Well, what are we really saying? We're saying, well, suppose they don't believe me. Because they're not going to listen to my voice. They're going to say, you're not a minister. I've, I honestly must admit that I've exerted myself far more vigorously with total strangers than some of my own relatives, in-laws, I mean, because... My nearest relatives are in the truth. And it must be like that with some of you, isn't it? It might be just me then. <laughs> but it happens every time I go back home. Um, one of my brother-in-laws, he's not in the truth. He always says, they always ask you the same thing, don't you? What are you doing now? I say, I'm still a minister. And he still says, you're not a minister. I say, oh yes, I'm a minister. When did you become a minister then? And I just have to say, well, actually, it was the 17th of March, 1957. Now, well, what happened then, then? Well, I was baptised as a minister. Where? Well, it was a rugby ground, actually. <laughs> and they do just what you're doing. Because to them, it's not real. You're not adequately qualified as a minister. God didn't appear to you. But he did appear to us. That's how we got the truth. And Jehovah is um, really proud of every one of his ministers because he has approved us all after baptism. He's just as proud of you if you're a dedicated, baptized minister as he was of his own son. Remember when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River? A river that Naaman certainly wouldn't bathe in a thousand years before. When Jesus came up out of the water, all of his hair bedraggled and water dripping off his nose and his face and a little bit of plant life to the side of his face, what was Jehovah moved to do for the very first time? And this is a key point in your latest watchtower which changes a lot of things when you read it. Brother, please. Oh, but uh, that was the occasion when Jehovah spoke in the, in the hearing of men. They heard the, the, the voice saying, this is my son, I have approved him. He'd never done that before. You can almost sense the pride in Jehovah's voice. For all to he hear, he said, this is my boy. And he was well pleased. And he approved him as a minister. And it's the same with all of you that are dedicated, baptized ministers. So never ever get the feeling, well, suppose they won't believe me. Or listen to my voice. Of course they will. Now, Jehovah understands that we do reason that way. 
So Jehovah says to you exactly what he said to Moses. If we feel inadequate, Jehovah will say to us, what is that in your hand? And what would you say? Well, we know what Moses said, Sister Nelson. A Bible in your hand. Have you ever looked up the word rod in the aid book? Well, you can now look it up in the book Insight into the Scriptures, if you were able to get those volumes in the summer. And look under the heading of rod. Now, one of the subheadings, it says, A rod was a symbol of authority and commission from God. What is our symbol of authority and commission from God? Well, it's this. It's not a rod, but it's the Bible. And when we go from house to house, if we use the Bible and bring it to life, they will believe that we're God's ministers. Now, the reason why we said that was because Moses, when he threw the rod on the ground, it wriggled and tingled full of life. And when he picked it up by the tail, it was a serpent until it turned into a rod. Now, what's our assignment? Well, we have to bring the Bible to life in our hand and if we want the Bible to exert power and be sharper than a two-edged sword Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says it will only happen when God's Word is alive in our hand now of course that's something we could all be working on but you can be sure if you're enthusiastic in your use of the Bible they'll believe you they'll recognize you as a minister. They may not submit to you at the door, some of them, but they'll go indoors and admit to themselves. He had something there. And that's sowing kingdom seed, isn't it? I always at this point like to recall that lovely experience that's been related many, many times of the new publisher that was going from house to house with his circuit overseer. Now this brother was so inadequate and so new that no matter what they asked him, or what viewpoint or objection they raised, they just got the one scripture. Well, he could only find the one, and that was Matthew 24, verse 14. He only had the one marker to find it anyway. So no matter what they asked, that's what they were going to get. So he went to a house with his circuit overseer, and introduced himself, and immediately went into Matthew 24, and verse 14. Can you see what it says there? It says, And this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness, and then the end will come. The man shook his head and said, I don't believe it. In fact, I don't really believe in God. My whole life has been filled with tragedy. Bad news. And this morning, before you've called, I've again received some bad news. It's not for me. Not the Bible. The publisher was undeterred and said, Now look, you said you'd, you'd watch it with me. See what the scripture says. It says, And this... Good news is what we're preaching. Now, the word gospel means good news. That's why it comes out of one of the gospels, Matthew 24 and verse 14. Now, I'll explain to you why it's good news. And he just bubbled over about the good news of the kingdom. And his traveling overseer said that the man warmed to him. Although he did say, well, it sounds marvelous and you'll probably get a world like that, but not with the government in this country. In fact, when you think of the government worldwide, you never get a world like that. And what did the publisher say? Look, would you just please read it with me again? Just again, the first part. It says, this good news of the kingdom is what we're preaching. Now, the word kingdom, it must be a word for government. Now, this will be one kingdom, one government for the whole world. It will last a thousand years. And off he goes telling him everything he knew about that kingdom. Would you say he was bringing the Bible to life in his hand where well, he certainly was? In fact, the man became convinced, he says, well, it would be possible then, with a perfect king and one world, one government. You won't get that in my lifetime. You're not watching the scripture, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses have been preaching this good news of the kingdom now for years. And what does it say in the scripture? And then the end will come. It will happen in your lifetime. Oh, he brought it to life in his hand. So much so that the amusing follow-through to that experience was that this man, he worked next to one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And when he went to work the next day, he said, you know, I had one of you people call on me yesterday. A Mr. So-and-so. Do you know, he really knew his Bible. <laughs> I could ask him anything, and he had the answers. Well, he didn't, of course. That's like the expression that was used in the Watchtower in recent years. It's not how much you know, it's how much you love what you know. And that might be a little of what you know, but if you love it a lot, people will respond to that. 
and they'll accept the good news of the kingdom. And just finally, what about the later sign? If they do remember you from years ago, when you were like Moses' hand, filled with leprosy, in a death-like condition, and they see you now as a changed person, they'll respond to the truth. If they will not believe the Bible, they'll positively believe the later sign that it has done something for you. As it has done for many, we've been to many assemblies throughout the country. That's the great privilege of the district work. You have the circuit assembly every week. So you have song and experiences every Saturday afternoon, and some of the experiences are outstanding. Like the one from the Dudley Assembly Hall. When we were there, there were three West Indian brothers interviewed. There are three of them were one-time Rastafarians. You know what the Rastas are? The Rastafarians. Their hair is plaited. Well, it's more matted than plaited. <laughs> and they take drugs and they come right along in the truth. And when they were interviewed, it was the people that changed them. And the changes that they had seen in people that they knew from years ago. We walked into a kingdom hall in Bristol. And we were greeted at the door by a very smart attendant. Immaculate, in fact, he was. Just in his early twenties. I took it for granted that he had been raised in the truth just by his appearance. He said, oh no, the first time I came to the Kingdom Hall was about 19 months ago. Actually, it was the service meeting and I didn't want to come in at the time. I actually sat on the wall outside there, too embarrassed to come in. I asked him, why was that? Oh, well, then I was a skinhead, you know. No hair here. Actually, I've got a full colour tarantula tattooed on the top of my head. I couldn't believe it. And I used to wear these funny typed overcoats and tight short type trousers. I think he used to wear boots made by a doctor he, he told us about. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. But he changed. We were in that district for two years and we saw him come through the Pioneer School. And after we left in three years, he was a ministerial servant. He'd made great changes, and if he ever meets anybody that he knew uh, from before, they will be totally convinced that he's got something. I might recognize he's got the truth. And yet even though Jehovah has revealed all those things to us, some of us still hold back and uh, feel that we can't do it properly. Or we have fear of man. While at the circuit assembly you'll realize that fear of Jehovah throws other fears outside. And not least, of course, fear of man. As it did with Moses, of course. Because when you read Psalms 91, that was the theme scripture of our song. It's uh, sung by a man that was full of courage. Remember when he said, Jehovah is my refuge, I shall not be afraid. That was penned by Moses, the meekest man in all the earth. So that's very, very good advice that James gave all of us in chapter 5 and verse 10. It would be good to take as a pattern uh, the prophets. Certainly the men like Moses and Jeremiah and Elijah and Ezekiel and all these others try to be like them.